Um, what is the purpose of the listing agreement? Who can tell me that? What is the purpose of the listing agreement? To establish a contract between the brokerage and the seller to sell their home. Right, right, absolutely. You get a right of sale. Right, exclusive right of sale, uh, meaning they can't sell it through anyone else. If they sell it during that time, um, you're still entitled to a commission because you're going to be spending the marketing and the effort to sell their house, right? Right. So it protects the brokerage, ergo you, from the seller acting outside of, of the interest of selling the home via your marketing, okay? So it protects us. That's why we have to have them. We have to have them for the law, for, for compliance, but we have to have them to protect us. Um, also, of course, it protects the, the sellers as well. That's why it's required by law. So um, as you're going through the property, you have the exclusive right to sell for a limited period of time. And just like any other contract, if there are no time limits, then it is not valid, right? So let's talk about this um, uh, under number one, where you have the authority to sell the property. Seller gives broker the exclusive right to sell the real and personal property, collectively the property described below at the price and terms described below beginning at a certain date. Now, if I talk to a seller and they want to sell their house, but I know I've got to get in there and we've got a bunch of paperwork to do. We've got, they're going to get some information for me on the prior survey or prior sale. We're going to have to get some professional pictures done, but it won't be clean until next Thursday, et cetera. What are, uh, when should I make this date of the exclusive, of the, of the beginning of the exclusive right to sell? When the house is presentable and ready to go. Right. When, when I know, yes, when I know through. that I can put the property on the market, it's because what is the new rule? How, how long do we have from the, the first date of this to uh, the time we get the property on the MLS? How long do we have? 48 hours. Right. So if I, but I, do I want to wait until next Thursday to get this because that's when I can take the pictures and have everything going? Or do I want to go ahead and get it signed now and go ahead and set the, this date for next Friday? You can get it signed now and then set the date for next Friday. Correct. That's the way to do it. Okay. So, um, and, and cause I've had people freak out before, oh my gosh, they signed it yesterday and I can't get it on the market now until next week. I said, well, the thing you need to change is the date at the top. It doesn't matter when they sign it. I can sign right. a listing agreement right now for one of you guys to sell my house starting on December 1st. Okay. It doesn't right. matter when I sign it. What matters is the dates up top here, how long it runs. Right. Okay. When right. It's open. Ryan, yes. if the if I sign the new form that can be the listing right away, but not put it on the MLS, the new the new form. You can do that if you want to do the if you want to do the extra work for that. You can do that, but there's no reason to. If I know I can't take pictures and get it on the market till then. Now, if they call me in the meantime and say, you know what, next Thursday is not going to work. We just had a death in the family. We're going to be out of town. Whatever then that's when you would do that or you would revise this listing agreement. I would modify the listing agreement, okay? Just so it's cleaner and you don't have to mess okay. with the MLS sheet and all that stuff and don't take any risk with the, um, don't take any risk with getting that hefty fine that they do now, okay? All right. Um, Ryan, real quick. Now. Yes. Uh, real quick, the listing um, agreement here, do you bring that to the listing presentation? When do you go over it with them? Absolutely. Bring it to the listing presentation because that's where you want to leave with signatures. Okay. So you absolutely take that. Okay. Um, and that's when you present it to them. But just like anything else that we do, this is not, hey, guys, you're going to be bound to me. You're stuck to me. Sign here. And there's nothing to be afraid of here. You present this as all of the things that you're going to do for them, right? You've listened to them. You know what their goals are. You know what terms they'll accept, and you're going to guide them on which terms to accept. You know when they should take a VA or an FHA and when they shouldn't, et cetera. And you can you can outline that now. You know whether you know. Look, we're going to. Um, we only want an as is. We only want this. We only want that. Right. You know, and you're going to guide them. And part of what you're selling them on is your expertise. Okay. So as you go through this form, it is not just sign this contract and you're stuck with me. I got you. Like you're you're like you're selling them timeshare, right? you're selling them all the things that you're going to continue to do for them through the length of this agreement or until the property is sold. Any questions with that? Okay. Um, 
All right. So when, when you go, all right, let's continue to go through here. Obviously you're going to list the, the street address and all that stuff, personal property, including appliances. Guys, this is very important. This is why you guys as real estate agents buy and buy so many washers and dryers and stuff like that. Stop doing that. Make sure all of this stuff has all of their personal property. If they're taking their washer and dryer, make sure it's on here. If they want to keep the refrigerator, make sure they put that as ex excluded. Okay. And then you have guys, you're professionals. You have to remember to put that on the MLS as well. And then on the contract. Okay. Particularly on the contract. What is more important about uh, when it comes to these things, the contract or the what's on the MLS? Contract. Well, the contract, it's all that matters, right? Legally. So for us, all of us as realtors, the MLS is very important. But for the actual consumer, the contract is what's important. Protect okay. your clients on the contract, okay? And on the MLS and protect yourself on this listing agreement. Because at some point the buyer, the seller is gonna tell you, they're gonna tell you, no, I told you the whole time we were taking these fancy Samsung washer and dryers, I'm gonna replace them with scratch and dent, right? And you're going to say, no, nope. you put on here. And look, always put the washer and dryer, but if they have a fancy one, put that on here. Okay. So you're going to put on here what, you're, what they're leaving and what they're taking. And then I want you to make sure you get that on the MLS. And then I want to make sure you get that on the contract. Okay. All right. Yeah. Give me some nods and stuff, guys. I can't tell if, if I'm frozen and if, if you guys are listening or anything. So give me some nods if you can hear me. Um, and uh, if you disagree, uh, just give me, shake your head if you disagree. Speak up. Um, Ryan, okay. Yes. Uh, yes. For me. Um, just a question. I, but is there a list of some appliances that are standard in a sale? Yeah, it's on the as is. It's on the contract. Um, it'll say okay. refrigerator. I'm going off the top of my head. Refrigerator range. Um, uh, it even does talks about ceiling fans and window dressings and all that window treatments and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Right. Um, and then that's when you write, but washers and dryers are infamously bought by realtors because they're not listed on there. But and I'm telling you because in this contract, it's, it just just says in uh, the part B, personal property, including appliances. It doesn't have the list. Okay. Would you do your own list or you do it? They're, they're going to put it on the data entry sheet, which we, which we weren't going to talk about today, but they're going to put it on the data entry sheet. They're gonna, that's why you, you want them to sign off on the data entry sheet because that says what they're taking or leaving. And okay. then you're going to put it on the MLS. You're going to put it on the contract. Okay. But I like it on here because I'll like go ahead and get it. So you guys, look, these are all of these things that you're filling out aside from the legal uh, street address and legal description are things that they're telling you. Okay. Things that you've agreed on with them. And that's how you present this to people. Look, we talked about your personal property. You said you guys wanted to take your washer and dryer. So let's go ahead and write that down here that you are not including your washer and dryer. This okay? is the line 17. We talk about things. Excuse Pardon me. Then? This is the line 17. Um, I'm online. Yes, yeah, 17. 17. 17. So as we're going through here, we are going to like any form that we present for people to sign. We talk about with the buyer brokerage agreement, which I'm going to do again here in a couple of weeks. We talk about all these things. It is, you are selling them on this. And when I repeat back to you what you've told me, when I talk to Natalie, let's say, about her son's baseball and stuff like that, I, she knows I listened to her and then I care about her, okay? People, when you listen to them and you repeat back to them what they tell you, they know that you listened and that you care. This is a way to let people know, hey, I'm taking great care of your property. I am gonna be your realtor. I'm your advocate. I am doing this for you. I am listening to you. I care about you. I don't just care about what we're going to talk about in a minute, which is commission. Okay. I care about all these other things. And so use each line of this to let them know. Right. Um, so as we're going, you guys said you want to take your washer and dryers because the place that you're looking at, you doesn't have a washer and dryer, or you guys want to leave these, this washer and dryer, whatever it is, make sure it's on here, make sure it's everywhere. Because when you show a property, you open it for showings, and they go in and they see the Samsung, it says here, concluded washer and dryer, and they go in and see the nice Samsung $2,000 washer, $2,000 dryer, they're gonna want that when they close. And if you've replaced those or they're missing or whatever, then guess who's buying a nice Samsung washer and dryer? Probably you and the other agent, if you want that deal to close at the closing table, right? So you guys, have, any of you guys who have been doing real estate a while have bought a washer and dryer, nod your head if you can agree to that. 
There you go. Everybody's bought washers and dryers. All right. So, um, price terms, you're going to go all over all this with them. Now, um, we teach a separate thing on the listing appointment, but when you come to them, I would not have the price written down here when you get to their house unless you've been in the house before. Okay. I think this is very important. I cannot tell you, I cannot drive by a house and tell you how nice that house is on the inside and why it's this. I might have a range of what it's worth based on what the neighbors are selling for, but if you've got um, brand new uh, granite countertops and the tile floors and all that stuff that the neighbors don't have, maybe your house is worth more, or maybe all of my comps have all that stuff and yours doesn't, and now I've gone in and oversold you on what I can sell your house for, right? Because when we go into a house, we want to go in and make recommendations. And we want to say, and I think it's very strong to say, you know, I, I know you've already met with a couple of renters and they've told you what your house is worth, probably had it written down before they even came in. I think it's important that we decide actually what your house is worth based on the improvements that you've made or maybe you need to make, right? Because it's not, you know, would you buy a house that is not updated for the same price that you would buy one that's updated? Of course not, right? So this is where you go through that with them. I would walk, first thing I do in a listing appointment is walk through the house with them um, you've heard people, uh, one of our agents on here talking about how he's very presumptive and walks right by him and starts making about the house. The more you get into something with someone with or, with or without their uh, verbal consent, but you're going around making notes about their house and stuff, they feel like you're, you're taking over. And some people that might, that might bother, but other people are going to be like, okay, this lady knows what she's doing. This gentleman knows what he's doing. And then once you get so far into it with somebody, they're not going to stop you as you go, and you're going to get farther along the process right off the bat. So Ryan, use your own use your own selling style for that. But that is one way to do it. Yes, ma'am, Ryan. Um, so when you go to this listing presentation with them, you should already have done your homework and like brought some CMAs with you, correct? Absolutely. But what you're going to pull and what I'm going to pull are probably going to be pretty similar. So I like to use the the thing. Let's say they're meeting with with uh, Malvis at 10 o'clock and they're meeting me at 11 and you at 12, okay? You're gonna go in there and you're competing with both Malvis and I and, and God knows who else, right? Um, they probably have a, a cousin or, or a sister-in-law or something that's a realtor also. So we're competing with all that. We're all gonna go in with similar CMAs, right? We're all getting all our information from the same sources. We're looking at very similar comps, probably the same exact comps. We're gonna go in similar CMA, CMAs but I'm going to take a look at their house because I don't know what someone's house is worth from the CMA. Mm -hmm. You guys have walked into houses before where they've got the date, everything's dated, right? And you know, gosh, it would take, it would take 30,000 to bring this up to what the neighbors, I saw the pictures from the neighbor's house and everything is pristine, right? So I'm going to go in or maybe there's, maybe it's the opposite. All the neighbors are dated and you go and you're like, wow, this is really nice, right? So I don't want to have this price written in ink right here until I get to their house. Okay, because I'm gonna I'm gonna pre-do a lot of this stuff. A lot of this form, I'm gonna pre like this one's filled out already. I'm gonna pre-fill in a lot of this stuff. I know the legal, I know that. Plus, I've taken the step, the fact that you've already pre-filled it out shows them that you expect to sell their house, right? You're confident that you're gonna get this listing and you're gonna sell their house. Okay. So fill out the stuff. I would leave, I would leave it blank. I know on line 19 occupancy, I know it is not currently occupied by a tenant, or maybe it is. But I typically, if I'm going to someone's house, it's not. So they are not, the, the person is not the tenant, by the way. If they're the homeowner, they're not, you can put, it is, it is not currently occupied by a tenant. That's the homeowner, they're fine. Um, financing terms. This is where we talk about this. You guys have, um, those of you who have a lot of experience know that FHA and VA can be tough. If you have an older house that's gonna have a lot of issues, a conventional loan is gonna be, work out a lot better for you, right? So, uh, you know, a conventional loan, I can come in and say, if I find 50 things wrong with this property, you know, the FHA won't let you close unless they've all been repaired. If I get a conventional loan, I can say, here's, here's, uh, we're going to, we're going to contribute $3,000 towards the 50 things that you showed me that were wrong, right? Or whatever little tiny things there are here and there that are wrong. I'm going to, my client could then not have to fix everything. You'll have that a lot when you have clients who are, uh, well, first of all, they're not handy. They don't want to. They don't want to do it. But they they are maybe absentee, uh, live in another state. They do whatever. They don't want to deal with all of that. And most of the times, the buyer would rather have the money too, because what are they going to do? Fix it later, 
right? If at all. So they're gonna if you have a house that's got a lot of little issues like that, that's that might be something that you consider doing is not taking FHA VA. But Let's even if you put it on here, you don't have to accept, you're just giving yourself the opportunity to. So I like to put on there, uh, especially if you have a lower price. Now, probably you're probably going to get a lot of it. <clears throat> I'll leave this front gate, I mean, this, this gate. So if you have a, uh, I like to give them the option of the FHA VA, um, and we can decide later based on what the offers are. But you should know what, what places are, are better suited and not better suited for FHA and VA. Um, any questions on that? Okay, you guys understand that pretty well. Um, uh, seller financing, stuff like that. If you guys get this, I would get a, an attorney involved for the most part. Um, you guys don't want to be handling any, any uh, purchase money mortgages or any of that kind of stuff without the knowledge. If you don't have the knowledge of how to do it, even if you do, recommend an attorney. Okay? Um, this part gets pretty, this part gets pretty, uh, intense and tricky. Brian, I have a question. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Regarding FHA loans, um, when you said that, you know, if there's 50 things wrong with the house, and, you know, something, and it's FHA financing, um, and they would have to be fixed. If, is that if, if the inspection report shows up all of that stuff, or is I'm it? Gonna, uh, Malvis, I can look at a house I can walk into a house today and tell you I probably wouldn't want to sell this FHA. You know, you know, you know the houses. You can walk around the house and see it's got wood rot under the, uh, and, and this is a lot of houses in Florida. Wood rot under the fascia, under the um, by the soffits, right? It's got a little bit of this, a little bit of soft here, a little bit of soft there. I'm no inspector, but I can tell uh, an older property that's a little bit run down is probably going to have issues. Okay. Um, I don't prefer FHA. We might do that, but that's when you end up ripping up a bunch of fascia and replacing the bottom of the front door and, you know, all this kind of stuff that you, you see when you walk up to a house. You have friends who have houses like this or, you know, lovely people, lovely houses, but you walk up and you see the woods rotted by the front door, you know, at the bottom of the front, I don't know if you guys have seen, but the bottom of the front door, the wood frame is rotted and you see stuff like that. All that stuff's going to have to be repaired if it's got anything like that for FHA. Okay. So it's better not it's better not to list it that way. If you have an offer that's coming with an FHA loan, the seller don't have to take it. But if it's full price, because in the MLS it said that it they didn't they didn't like FHA loans. Correct, correct. And you guys keep in mind too. Uh, well, and this is a this is a a, a grander theory about uh, appraisal and all that. You guys keep in mind that selling something for when you take an offer, and this is not to say that all FHA offers are like this, but you know, if I ask you one thing about an FHA offer that you're probably almost always going to see, um, what is that? What do you know when you get a full price FHA offer, what do you know is going to be in the additional terms? Help with closing costs. With closing costs, exactly. Are you doing your client, and I'm not saying don't take FHA loans, do not take it this way. And great, this is going to be recorded. But I'm not saying don't take FHA loans. But what I'm, uh, when you take anything, even if it's higher price, so they'll come in. You have a house listed, let's say 229, okay, and they come in at 235 with three percent back. Keep in mind that is that better a better offer than a 220 229 regular offer that's full asking no. price because they went 235 with three percent back. No, it's not just the money. But what happens is this house ends up appraising for 225 mm -hmm. and the 229, you can drop that to 225 and be stuck at 225, which is great. I can sell that to my seller because I can say, look, this is full appraisal. This is what's going to happen. No matter what we sell, we're going to have this appraisal unless we get a cash deal, which we didn't, you know, we had it listed for three weeks. We didn't get any cash deals. So unless we get a cash deal, this is the best we're going to do is, is right around appraisal, right? If I have that, if I took that greedy 235 offer minus 3% or whatever, and I go in now, I've got, now I'm down to 225 minus 3% because FHA is not going to let me go to above appraisal, right? Mm -hmm. And these people, the FHA client obviously did not have a bunch of cash or they wouldn't have asked for 3% back at closing, right? So keep I, that I have mind. a question with that. Yes, ma'am. So in regards to that, if you get above asking price with... Uh, closing costs for the seller to pay 
and the house doesn't appraise for the offer price, do you still have to honor the closing cost if you lower the, pl the price of the house? No, no. So okay. what you do is you, steal, you, you can offer them, look, uh, okay, this is, this is one of my grand economic pet peeves here is uh, I usually have a pen. And when I have a pen, I say, what is this pen worth? And um, I'll sell this pen. Well, Andres, Andres needs a pen so badly. He's got a huge contract he needs to write. And he needs to do it right now. And he needs a pen. That pen's worth $10 to Andres. But Andres doesn't have $10. So he says, hey, Fernando, can I borrow $10 for this pen? And Fernando says, hey, I, how do I know you're going to pay me back? And Andres says, well, if I don't, you can have the pen back. You can have this pen. And Fernando says, I don't want that pen for $10. That's ridiculous, right? So that's what, that's what this is. So you sell a house. Andres thinks your house is worth $235. Even though it's only listed at $229, he loves your house, thinks it's worth $235. But he's borrowing that money. And Fernando's the bank. And Fernando says, it's not worth that much. I want, you know, I know I can take the house back if you don't pay me, but it's not that much. It's only, it's only worth, it's worth 15 cents, Andres, not, not $10. So I'll loan you 15 cents on it because I wouldn't mind having the pen back for 15 cents. It's a nice pen. So that's where we come with this. So my grand, my grand pet peeve economically is a house is worth or anything is worth, that pen is worth whatever somebody says the market says they'll pay for it, right? And to Andres, that pen was worth a lot. He loved it because he needed it. But... Fernando is more, he's not emotionally involved. And he says, that's nonsense to pay that much for a pen. I can't justify loaning you that much money for a pen. So that's how, that, that's how appraisals work. So, but that doesn't mean my house is low. So when, when, just because Fernando says my pen isn't worth $10, I know my pen is worth $10 because Andres was going to give me $10 for it, right? So the truth is the pen is worth somewhere in between. And this so my deal with my deal with Andres when he can't come up with the ten dollars, my deal with him is off. I can say, look, come up with the ten dollars somewhere somehow, or I've got to put this pen back on the market because I agree. I don't think it's worth fifteen cents. It's worth more than fifteen cents, but I got to put this pen back on the market. Okay. So your deal with them is off if they can't come up with a difference. So you tell you tell them, look, your appraisal didn't work out. You appraised for two twenty five. Our contract's two thirty five. It doesn't work out. Um, let me know if you guys can come up with the additional ten thousand right? Make it work. Because the FHA will still loan that money on it, but you've got to come up with the rest. So any lender, lender will still loan whatever percentage of 225 they were going to do for 235. But now that they're appraised for 225, they're only going to do a percentage of that instead of the percentage of 235. So now uh, you either got to come up with a different kind of loan or you got to come up with the cash, the difference in between. Okay. Otherwise your deal's off. So now when I go back to my say, look, we can do, uh, all right, my seller will do the 225, but we're not giving anything back for closing costs. That's what I was going to ask. That, yeah, that so, was my question. So, so you, you once, if the house... If you renegotiate one enough. term, you can renegotiate anything. And this goes for the inspection and everything else. Okay? So if, you, if they want to renegotiate one thing, everything's back on the table. Ryan, when the house doesn't uh, appraise and um, you got to sell it for a lower price, do you have to go back in MLS and relist it? No, you do not have to sell it for a lower price. That's what I'm telling you. You do not have to accept okay. a lower price. Appraisal okay. doesn't mean anything in the real world. It only means what a lender will do. And an appraisal can come back different the next time you sell it. So it might appraise for 225. The FHA buyer can't come up with 225, whatever. But now I've got another buyer for 235 again. And I get it appraised and appraised at 232. You know? So, it, no, you are not. No, you're absolutely not stuck with appraisal. Appraisal is not. That's my whole point. Ricky. Appraisal is not real. Market value is real. That's a real thing. Yeah. Appraisal is just what someone decided based on somebody who went out there and, and spent an hour at the property and sat in front of their computer for an hour and decided that's what it's worth based on whatever some other idiot has paid for something else. But it's hard to, it's hard to value with this property. Like we talked about earlier, I can't just look at comps and say, that's what this house is going to sell for. Right. I got to go in that. I got to, I got to determine what the house is actually, actually worth. And then you guys have all done this before you put a house on the market and got no offer for what you thought was a great price, got no offers. Then you put one on the market that's been overpriced and got tons of offers. It just, it happens. That's what market value is. Market value is whatever, whatever people bring in there and they want to pay. I know I, I got cut off a little bit there. You guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. You can appeal, so, a, you can appeal an appraisal as well, right? 
You can. You can. You can contest an appraisal. It is a typically a losing proposition. It is. Um, it is difficult. Sometimes they forget a room. It is very well. And I'm going to have another. Um, I want to have another appraiser come in and talk to you guys. We had a good one a couple of years ago. Came in and told us the whole process, the numbering process. It's a very, very um, uh, intricate process that they use to determine the value on a one to five scale, and then they do all this stuff. It's a. It's a. It's. It is. Uh, it's very. It is. Uh, Byron just says it's subjective. It is subjective, but it's also very computer driven you know, very model driven, which doesn't get you, uh, you guys know, you guys know you're out there in the field, you go into a house, you know, it's not, everything is not just cut and dry. Okay. Um, the, the houses in a neighborhood that back up to a uh, conservation area. And then another one says it does, but it's not. And you can see, you know, some of them are water view, but they can only see the water. If you stand up in the, on the stool and you look out the corner of the, of the back door, you know what I mean? and other ones are right on the water. So there's all kinds of different things that you know that are technically the same, but when you actually get in the house, you see they're much different, right? An updated kitchen uh, to, to one person might not be updated to another, you know? So there's different things. Um, any other questions on that? Um, Ryan, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so just tell me if this makes sense though, because I've seen in the MLS that um, I've come across a listing where it says um, they just want to see offers with pre-approvals, I guess. Mm -hmm. Now, is that smart to do? Um, or does that kind of limit them to other offers? Is that something you'd want to suggest to your client or? I, I would, I would um, uh, some clients will suggest that to you, but they'll say, I don't want a bunch of people transferring who can't afford it. Those are typically going to be the higher end houses. Um, I'm going to, you know, the, the, first of all, the buyer's agent should be making sure their people are pre-approved. Um, mm -hmm. You can ask for that. Feel free to ask for it. Um, typically people, I've, I've seen that asked for and then people don't enforce it anyway. Um, okay. But typically that's going to be on the higher end stuff, the nicer houses where people okay. can ask for that. Okay. So, so it kind of um, weeds out the people. You can, you can ask for it if you want to. Okay. So it kind of weeds out the people who are more serious or it also expedite, uh, expedites the process, right? Right. Well, if I have a, if I have a $700,000 listing, I know there's only so many people that can afford it anyway. I don't want everybody trudging through the house when I know many of them, uh, human nature is that buyer's agents aren't going to be out there taking their $300,000 clients into $700,000 homes because that's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And before, if I'm a buyer's agent, I'm definitely, if I've got somebody looking at $700,000 home, I'm going to make sure they're pre-approved because I don't, you know, I don't know unless I know them and know what they do. Actually, even if I know them, I'm going to make sure that they have good jobs. I might know that they have good jobs or whatever, but I want to make sure that they are credit-wise, credit -wise, credit -wise. Mm -hmm. So you can't ask for uh, you can't ask for that. If I'm representing a high end house, those are also typically the ones where they say the listing agent must be present too. You know, these are typically the nicer houses. A lot of times they want to see the pre the pre approvals. And, okay. And they, a lot of times the listing agent must be present because they don't want you trudging through their nice house. Okay. Thanks. But if I'm selling if I'm selling something for two hundred thousand, I, I you know guys go ahead. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right, so let's move on with the, uh, the seller financing. If you're doing any of this stuff that you don't understand, even if you do understand it, I prefer that a, 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 an attorney gets involved. Same thing for, for lease options. You guys are doing lease options, get an attorney involved. Don't, don't do it yourself. Um, that's a good way to get in trouble, a lot of liability, um, and chances are you don't know what you're doing. Um, broker obligations. Broker agrees to make diligent, and the guys, this is where you're selling them on what you're going to do for them. Broker agrees to make diligent and continued efforts to sell the property in accordance with the agreement until a sales contract is pending on the property. Um, I would go above and beyond that and say you're going to see it all the way through to closing on their behalf, but that's this is what you this is what the paper says. But I would go, I would expand on that. Let them know all the things that you're going to do for them. Um, multiple listing service, you guys know that one. Um, seller authorizes broker 
to do the following. Market the property for the public. Public marketing includes, not limited to, flyers, yard signs, digital marketing. This is where you go through with them. If you haven't already done through throughout, throughout the presentation, you're going to go through with them all the things that you're going to do for them, um, including open houses, et cetera. Why do we do open houses? Anybody know? Why do you do open houses? So I can sell it myself. <laughs> right. Why else? To find new buyers. Attract buyers. Attract buyers. More leads. Right. For more leads. And it can be both buyers and sellers. All of the above, guys. Great. Thank you, Edwin. All of the above. Right. We're going to get out there and do that. The number one reason we do it, to make the seller happy. Makes them happy. Makes them know we're trying. We're going to get our signs out there, open house, balloons, whatever you want. Get them to come to the house, right? We are showing that we're making the effort because does every house sell uh, in the first week, first month? No, right? Who do they turn on when things don't sell? They turn on, they turn on Natalie, right? <laughs> they turn on whoever their, uh, whoever their agent is, right? It's your fault my house isn't selling. My cousin sold their house in a week up in Idaho. I don't know what your problem is, right? My neighbor sold... I know they sold for 25,000 less than me last month, but they sold in two days, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that's, you'll hear, uh, am I lying? I mean, you hear this stuff. And mm -hmm. except they don't admit that it was for $25,000 less. They just say, my, well, my neighbor sold. Um, and that's absolutely, and when it doesn't sell, they blame you. Is it harder to blame someone who's doing open houses every every other weekend and who's out there with flyers and out there doing stuff and they it's harder you're sending, mm -hmm. they're sending you they're send you're sending them your facebook marketing you're sending them something you put on linkedin you put anywhere right doesn't necessarily sell the property but it does a it does get you leads. A, a it makes them happy b it gets you more leads it gets you more um more people out there sharing your posts and liking your posts and get your, your tentacles out there to get a hold of people more, right? That's the kind of thing that you need to do um, to let them know what you, first of all, you tell them up front. Second of all, you tell them that. Um, when I go back to the MLS part though, um, this is where you're going to want to go with them. And I would get guys, I, and I've seen some of you guys have this. When you put it in the MLS, it puts it automatically populates in all of these websites steal their logos and put them on a piece of paper. And when you go in and say, this is where everywhere your house is going to be marketed through me. Right. And plus anything else that you do individually, but come in there and there's, there's Zillow, Trulia, realtor.com, blah, 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 all the places they've heard of and some they haven't get all of those on there. Say, when I market your house, this is it now when, when Malvis comes in after I do, she's going to say, I'm going to put it on the MLS. And they're going to say, huh, that last guy was going to put it on, 25 websites for us. But, well, guess what? That's just from the MLS, but Malvis doesn't point that out. And I did, right? Mm -hmm. I say, when you list with me, this is all the places it's going. Malvis, they're going to say, Malvis, what, what websites are we going to be on? She said, well, we're putting on the MLS. How are you going to market my property? I'm going to put on the MLS and I'm going to do some open houses. Oh, when Malvis leaves. They're going to say that last guy was going to do MLS open houses. Plus put us on those, you know, those 20 websites, right? It's the same thing. Right. All right. So let and them know all the link. things that you're doing for them and get their property out there. Yes, Rita. There's a link in the MLS University. I'm trying to look for it real quick that lists every other website that MLS cooperates with. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Rita, I think I, I, I don't know if I saw that list or if someone took that list and uploaded and, and, and dumb and I can go on their websites and steal their logos so put their logos on a, a piece of paper yeah it does it okay yep but get get it go get a color copy go to kinko's whatever you gotta do if you don't have a color copier and put their logos on a piece of paper and show people when you go in for their listing agreement all the places it sends it to okay but for now if you before you do that if you just want to get the list and show them the list that's fine i think it looks a little better with all the fancy logos that they recognize all right um, and some that they don't, which is great. It's going to be on places they don't even know exist, which is fantastic. Um, all right. Um, Can you guys throw out what other places, like social media um, platforms that you guys advertise on? <laughs> like any other ones besides, you know, Trulia, Zillow, uh, Facebook, Instagram, um, Realtor.com? 
Does anybody else use any other different places? Any other sites? Or Ryan, do you have any other? I don't, I don't, um, uh, I, I don't know what other sites people would be looking on. Um, I like, I think we talked about this last week. I like putting them on, uh, I know we talked about this last week. I, I like the idea, I wouldn't do it because I don't know my way around there, but put your listings on Pinterest. Um, it's just another place to tell people you're doing that, but it also gets you out there, right? Um, uh, I would make YouTube, make a YouTube page and put your listings on that. Google loves mm -hmm. YouTube. So make a YouTube virtual thing and put it there. Okay. Um, yes. I, you can, I put it on Facebook marketplace, not Perfect. my Facebook page, but the marketplace. Okay. Right. Thank you. Awesome. You can uh, do Amazon and Craigslist as well. Did you there say you Craigslist? Craigslist and Amazon. Okay, thank you. Edwin, how do you do it on Amazon? You actually have to create an account with Amazon. There's an advertising tab when you have uh, an account with them, so you go and list everything you have, but you have to get um, approval from them. Okay. How, how much they charge? I'm sorry? Amazon, how much they charge? Um, there's one that doesn't charge anything. When you have the, uh, it, it's called the sell, seller's force, something like that. I'll pull it up and then I send an email. You guys can see it. There's there's a there's one you can just put it for free, and there's another one that you pay for it. It depends on how much you want to spend. It's just like Facebook. Great, they thank you. They deliver the home. You're welcome. I'm sorry. They deliver the home next day. Yeah, they Only just. If you're five, <laughs> five member, they deliver it. People like Instagram too. Instagram and ways. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Edwin. So you're welcome. So um, moving along here, um, there are places that they don't. If they don't want them, sometimes people will not want them to display it on MLS, as you guys know. Um, and there's forms for that. And you guys know that we, we just talked about that, um, the exclusion form. Um, a, um, sometimes they don't want to sign in front of the house. You know, you guys have dealt with all of this stuff. Sometimes they don't, and you've listened to them. And so you'll go through these with them. Um, they, you will, public marketing also includes marketing the property to real estate agents outside the broker's office. That's very important. Let them know how many realtors there are and that all of them are going to get updated on this. Anyone searching in their price range of 300 to 399 or whatever is going to see this property and blah, blah, blah. Explain to them, educate them, let them know what's going on in the market. Let them know what's going on in, in, um, uh, in their neighborhood. Let them know what's going on and let them know how we market the property. It's important that they do that. Um, that they know that the, um, I talked about how they might not want it on there. Okay, using a lockbox system to show and access the property. Um, I don't advise doing this unless, um, well, you could, uh, unless it's vacant or if you've arranged with them to do that. I, I don't like it. I don't like, I don't like putting it there if someone lives in the house. Someone lives in the house, depending on the house. If someone lives in the house, I prefer, I've seen it all. I mean, a lot of times, uh, the owners will leave and you go there in an electronic lockbox to get in. Other times the owners stay to let you in and then they leave, whatever it is. Sometimes the owners want to be there. You never know. Um, it is difficult. It's great for a vacant home. It is difficult when you have sellers who are still in the home and people want to see the property. Um, if it's a, if it's a, uh, depending on the seller, the listing agent may want to be there for the showings. Um, otherwise you end up arranging with them a phone call and all this stuff and back and forth and and you guys know how realtors are you set an appointment for 3 30 and then you're running late and then you're or can i come at 2 45 because i'm going to be in the neighborhood or you guys are paying the butt so it may or it may or may not work out that way but if you uh i don't like to have a lockbox and, and listen, I, I i manage a lot of you guys and so i get a lot of complaints about it. and some of these have been and i get complaints from you about other agents there have been many times where people have walked into a house with people in there are you guys familiar with those stories? Yeah. Okay, some of you have probably been involved in some of those stories on, on one side or the other. It happens a lot. So just be careful with the lockboxes of houses that are occupied. 
okay? Um, seller is advised to secure or remove valuables. Absolutely, if, especially if they're not gonna be there. Even if they are gonna be okay. there, can't follow the, you don't want them following the people around the house and making sure they don't steal anything. That's ridiculous. Um, I'm sorry, Ryan. So, Yes. Sorry, real quick. So what is the best method then if the homeowners are still living there? What do you recommend doing? I, I want I want their stuff I want their stuff uh, secured and locked up. If they're still living there, it depends on the seller. Some will want to be there, insist to be there for all the showings. A lot of these people though, they have firearms, they have jewelry, they have whatever. Mm -hmm. Even if you're the listing agent, you guys have been around in there and you'll have the husband and wife or whoever it is walking around with you and one of them will disappear, go look at the other room because they're more interested in that. And you don't know if they're pocketing stuff or doing whatever, right? And the seller, I mean, you might trust them okay because, you know, maybe they're friends of yours or whatever, but the seller wouldn't. And so I recommend that the seller secures everything, lockbox or no lockbox, because even if the seller's home, they're not going to be following these people around. Mm -hmm. And even if they feel like they're following the people around, the kids just went in the other room, right, or whatever happened. And so they need to secure everything that they have of any value whatsoever um, before, they show, before the house is shown. Um, right. Who, who who has the liability if something comes up missing? Who's liable for that? Uh, that's a great question. I would direct you to an attorney because I don't know. Um, fortunately, we haven't had it's that. It's a great case. matter. Yeah, yeah it, it's okay. It's the, yeah. yeah. But, so when I was taking my uh, broker's class, they say that agents are responsible for any missing items. So, of course, you can verify with an attorney. Yeah, it's very yeah. hard to prove that something was stolen. It's very hard to prove what was stolen. You know, mm -hmm. oh, there's $200 missing from my house. Well, you know, uh, how, do, how do you know? You know, this was stolen, that was stolen. How do you know? You know, it's it's very, you don't want to be in that situation. Just have them lock up anything of any value, secure it. Um, right. Okay, this is withhold verbal offers and withhold all offers once seller accepts a sales contract for the property. I don't necessarily, want to withhold verbal offers, but I do want to withhold all offers after a pro after an offer has been accepted. That does nothing but create trouble a lot of times, right? You can't get out of the first offer anyway as the seller. And so you get a better offer right afterward. I, I'm going to withhold offers. Um, I, I mean, how many times have you sold a property and then you get a call right after it goes pending and they say, oh man, we would have paid an extra 10,000 for that. Well, if I go tell the seller that, then what's he going to try to do with his first offer? I should get wiggle, out. Wiggle out, right? And it's not necessarily a good thing. Yes. But what I will do is I'll take their information and I will let them know if the first, it, it, the first minute the property, this current contract falls apart because that's doing something on behalf of my seller to help them. Okay. So that's that. And I'll let my seller know if we, the first sign, when those first people come back and say, uh, yeah, we did the inspection and we want $5,000. So we want you to fix this and this. I'll let my seller know, look, we had other offers, uh, other people that were very willing to make offers um, when we took this one. So if you want to put it back on the market, let's do it. All right. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, virtual office websites. The seller does not, let's go down to the uh, line 80. Seller does not authorize an automated estimate of the market value of the listing to be displayed in immediate conjunction with listing of this property. When do we, when do we want that checked? When do we want to not allow that? If they don't want you to do it. If, if, if I, I didn't hear what you said when you broke up a little bit. Um, I'm sorry. What was the question? Which line? It's what line was the question? Line 80, why would you ever check the seller does not authorize an automated estimate of the market value of the listing? After you ask them and they tell you no, they do not accept it. <laughs> well, that's, that's right. But why would, we, why would we recommend that to them? Um, we wouldn't. I'm just saying if, you, uh, if somebody, in case somebody does, then you'll check that. But this is something I never recommend. Um, what, if you're, what if you're listing it for 369 and there's estimate says 327? What I usually, I, I'll have a conversation and tell them, okay, this is what I think it should be listed at. But since you want to go over that price, we can try it out for a week. And if we don't get any feedback, then we have to uh, sit down and do a, considering a price adjustment. 
No, no, Edwin, what you're, what you're saying is perfect. Somebody can say. Right. What you're saying is perfect for listing the property. Huh? Somebody can I'm, write a comment. What, what I'm saying is this. Go ahead. If you, if okay, you, no, that's the next one. So, ah, okay. Okay, so that's the, that's the next box. So this box <laughs> though, Edwin, what you're saying is perfect for, for listing the property. But I'm saying mm -hmm. we've already come up with a price of 369. Okay, we've been through okay. our, we've been through our back and forth and, and come up with a price of 369. But mm -hmm. the estimate on the property is 327. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So the estimate on the property is 327. We know the right listing price is 369. We know the house mm -hmm. is worth 360, 360, 365, but we're listing at 369. Okay. The mm -hmm. estimate, so when other people see this house on Zillow, they're gonna see 327 and they're gonna think our price is crazy, right? We can we can get that price, we can get that estimate taken off. Does everybody understand that? Everybody's frozen. You, we'll, everybody you're waking we can up. get that estimate taken off. How do you yeah. take it off? We're waking up, yes. Um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you do that? Um, contact Zillow. Contact Zillow. They'll take it off. Um, contact Zillow as the owner or as the representative of the owner, and they will take it off. You guys have seen? Have you guys seen a listing that says estimate none? All the time. Yes. Okay. Um, we are selling one right now for one of our property management owners, and it says estimate none because his his house is his his. It's half a duplex and it's worth 165 and the estimate was 94,000. So now it says none. Okay? Just a phone call? How they are going to do it? You ya, you have to show the listing? You have to No, nope, no, nope, just tell them. You can you can register uh, have their owner register as owner and do it or you can um, you can do it as agent. As listing agent. All right. Okay. okay. Thank so, you. but but third party. Okay, let's talk about the next one. So, no line eighty two. Seller does not authorize third parties to write comments or reviews about the listing of the property. Have you guys ever had the actual buyer write a positive review about what a great thing it was and why they bought it and they're so happy? No, they don't do that. So, what do people put on your, your feedback? comments do you guys see negative right um house was okay but bad neighborhood you know uh house was nice but but too expensive um nothing that makes you want to buy right it's all the reasons they didn't buy the house nobody ever says house was perfect um we wish we could buy it but it was too awesome for us right it's always something negative why they didn't buy it so i always disallow third-party comments okay they're never helpful. Um, weird floor plan, um, you know, overpriced, whatever. It's not good. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, can hear you. Okay. Um, all right. So seller obligations. Cooperate with broker. Um, recognize broker may be subject to additional MLS obligations, potential penalties for failure to comply with them. Provide broker with keys to the property and make property available for broker to show during reasonable times. Inform broker before leasing, mortgaging, or otherwise encumbering the property. That could be a problem, right? Um, and we're going to get to some of this stuff here in a minute. Make all legally, go down to line 99. Make all legally required disclosures, including all facts materially affect the property's value, are not readily observable known to the buyer. Seller certifies and represents the seller knows of no such material facts other than the following. I always put none there. Make sure you don't just leave that blank. Makes them sign off on there's nothing wrong with this house or tell you what is wrong with the house. Okay. But if you've already asked them this question, which you will when you do this, if you haven't already, they're going to say, no, nothing I know of. Or, oh, yeah, but we got a sinkhole in the backyard. Whatever it is, they need to make it known. Right. And you want to know now. Um, and then also they're going to do, of course, the seller's property disclosure. Compensation. This is where people get, this is where people get confused. Um, are you guys with me? I'm uh -huh. sorry, yes. seeing people please and stuff. Okay, compensation. 
Seller will compensate broker as specified for procuring a buyer who is ready, willing, and able to purchase a property or any interest in the property on the terms of this agreement or any other terms acceptable to seller. Seller will pay broker as follows. Now, um, what if we get the buyer or get, get the seller a cash offer for full asking price with all the terms they asked for and the buy, and the seller backs out? The seller? Yeah, the seller backs out. They say, you know what? I don't want to sell the house anymore. They still got to pay you. Uh, offer and they don't want to sell it. You bought them a no. qualified buyer, right? They still got to pay you your fees. Would be my guess. If they already have a contract with a buyer and they say, I don't want to sell anymore. No, they don't have a contract yet. You present them with a contract oh. and they say, you know what? I don't want to sell it anymore. Oh, well then. As no. long as it's not signed. Well, there's no, no you got a signed contract. contract. You don't have a signed contract. You have the buyer ready, willing, and able buyer. It says right here in the, in the language, compensation seller will compensate broker as specified for procuring a buyer who is ready, willing, and able to purchase the property. Not for city. You still have to pay. It's got to be signed though, right? Got to be signed, doesn't it? The listing agreement. Um, they're signing the listing No, that's the listing agreement is already signed, so they have to pay you for it. Well, I pay you. I got to pay you then. They have to pay you then at the sign. They have to pay the seller's agent. They, they, they would have to pay. They would have to pay both, but yes. you know, the whole the whole six percent or seven percent or five percent, whatever you guys have in there. But here's the problem. Not every term of a contract is outlined in here. It's incredibly hard to enforce. So if you bring them that and they say, they could say, if they go to an attorney, they're not going to come up with this on their own, but if they go to an attorney, the attorney is going to say, look, yeah, they brought you a ready, willing, and able, but you know, some of the terms of the contract aren't listed on this listing agreement. When do they have to close by? And they say, well, they want to close in three weeks. Well, tell them you want to close in three days or you're not a deal because it's not outlined in this listing agreement. Okay. They are not going to pay. I've never seen this enforced where they pay the commission. Now a contract, once you have the contract signed and the seller backs out, part of their specific performance is if they don't want to sell the house in the end is they do have to pay real estate commission. They have to pay any expenses taken on by the buyer, um, having to move their stuff to hotels because they sold their old own house and all that kind of stuff. All the stuff we talk about with specific performance, we talk about it, I think almost every week in here, uh, what to do if a seller tries to back out. But commission is one thing they do if that's the case. But this says, this says exactly what you guys are saying. It says they have to pay you if you bring in that buyer. It is just incredibly hard to enforce. All right. Maybe if you have some going back and forth with them of, hey, they want to close in three weeks. Is that okay? In writing? Yes. Yeah, that's great. Three weeks is great. Blah, blah, blah. And then they get to the last minute. They don't want to sign it. That's one thing. Um, but very hard to enforce. There's all kinds of other little terms in the contract. They can say, oh, I don't like that one. And it's not in the listing agreement. Because there's nothing in the listing agreement about when it has to close or anything like that. There's all kinds of terms in the contract. Um, so just keep that in mind. Now, what? Um, uh, yes. if he discovered that his cousin is also a realtor and he wants to transfer the, the... Oh, they can't do that. Okay. No, no, no. They can't do that. And we cover that later on in here. Anyone that you procured, you're going to be covered for a period of time. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, I have to... a question. Yes. So what if the seller, the house is in the, in the MLS for 200000 and they do get an offer for 200000 no asking, no asking for closing cost, you know, even a cash offer closing in two weeks. And we present the offer and then the seller say, you know what? I changed my mind. I don't, I don't want to sell. Now they, they have to sell, don't they? Because, because they, 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 they got an offer for what they said in that market that they were going to sell for. They got a full price. Okay. They don't have to sell. You can never make anybody sell. You can, you can ask them specifically perform all the other things of the contract. The, mm -hmm. you can't, but you can't make them sell. You can make them, um, you can make them pay all the commissions. You can make them pay all the expenses. Everybody took the, for the inspection, the, the, um, for the appraisal, for the, this, that, everything that anything, money that was spent, any damages that were done, it's going to cost them a lot of money not to sell. Okay. okay. 
but you can't force them to sell. Okay. Everybody got that? That's the risk they take yes. on when they, when they list their property, when they sell their property. Okay. Um, hey, what's the risk the buyer has? Only the secure, only the escrow deposit. That's the only risk the buyer has. Okay. Um, so let's go to uh, uh, Jean Verdellis. You raised your hand. Do you have something? Or was that accidental? Okay, may have been accidental. All right, um, let's go to line 109. Um, 6%, 7%, 5% of total purchase price. Plus, if you want to put your 350 in here, then do that. Okay. Everybody understand that? Any questions on that? It's not the total of the commission. If it's six, if it's five, if it's that's seven. the total of the commission plus 350. If you want to do the 350 or the okay. 175, whatever program you're on, it says 6% or 7% or whatever plus 350, right? Or a flat fee. Okay. All right. Yeah. And it says on here, closing is not a prerequisite for buyer's fee being earned. What does that mean? That's supporting the previous, the line 106, right? It's supporting that. Um, all right. But what you're telling these people is, are you sure this is, if you get this exact deal that you're telling me that you'll take it? Absolutely. We're going to list it for 369 and I'll, yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, okay. Um, next one. If, if you're selling options, if you guys are, if you guys are doing that, just contact me. I'll help you with that. Um, if they decide to lease it, now this happens sometimes. Sometimes people will say to you, or I'll take a lease if it's a good, if it's a good, if I can rent it for $2,500 a month, I'll take that, right? So you put this in here too. Put 6% of gross lease value as a leasing fee if that's what you're, if they talk to you about that, if you think that's an option for them. Um, broker's fee is due in the following circumstance. If any interest in the property is transferred, whether by sale, lease, uh, if, if they sell the property, if they refuse to fail to sign an offer at the price and term stated in this agreement, defaults on an executed sales contract or agrees a buyer to cancel an executed sales contract, if within 60 days or 90 days, this is where, Fernando, this is where you put it in, if they sell the property after they fire you, if they, you know, you bring them a deal and your, your deal either expires before they sign a contract or they're already negotiating or whatever, you've already shown the home to someone and then they want to do a deal, you are, it's called the protection period, okay? Um, so that's something that protects you guys from, and believe me, people have tried this. They terminate their deal with you and then they take, they try to take an offer from somebody you showed the house to, right? Maybe they negotiated with them before. And if we could just get this Natalie out of the way, we'd have had this deal closed, right? It happens. Um, retain deposits. Some of you guys do this, um, as consideration for broker service brokers is entitled to receive 50% of all deposits the seller retains as liquidated damages for buyer's default in the transaction, not to exceed the paragraph eight fee. So obviously it can't be more than your total compensation and it wouldn't be. But if you're receiving, well, it could be on a, on a big deal, but let's say, uh, cause I've seen $50,000 deposits before, right? Escrows. So if you're doing that um, and someone has a $5,000 escrow and they back out, then you get $2,500. All right. Um, if you do that. Theoretically, if you leave it blank, you do. Okay. Um, all right. This is where people get confused. How many of you guys, um, you can just nod along or raise your hand or speak up. How many of you guys have had somebody say, hey, this is 9% commission. I see six and then another three. Have you guys had that happen? Sellers have asked you that before. Is this is, nobody's asked you that before? Because this is confusing to most people um, or a lot of people. They see compensation, then they see cooperation with compensation to other brokers. The buyer's broker, even if compensated by seller or broker, may represent the interest of the buyer. Broker's office policy is to cooperate with all other brokers except when not in the seller's best interest and offer compensation in the amount. It does not specifically say that it comes out of the other part. Okay, this is where you write the 3%, 2.5, 35 whatever it is that you're offering the other agent, okay? Um, and you can offer them a, a percentage or a flat fee, 3% of the purchase price or $5,000 to a single agent and same for the uh, transaction broker. And some people do zero, 1% or full amount for the um, non-rep, okay? Um, this is where this form says broker will act as a transaction broker. 
So let's talk about the transaction broker form. Why, we, why would we use a transaction broker form versus a single agent form? Um, the transaction broker, one of the reasons is you may, you may personally get both sides of the, of the deal. And if you do that, you have to go back to them with a transaction to transaction broker form or transition to transaction broker form, right? And you have to explain to them is, look, I know you told me about your divorce and all your economic problems and this and that, but I got to pretend like I don't know that with this other party, okay? That can be an uncomfortable conversation, right? Anybody ever had that conversation with people before? Raise your hand if you've had that conversation. None of you have ever transitioned to transaction broker? You've all been using the transaction broker form? Fantastic. Also, it may not be you. Natalie may have a listing that Andres buys the buyer for. Malvis has a listing and George Lumen buy, brings the buyer. We are have we have almost 500 realtors out there under FRI. There is likelihood that you'll do business with FRI. We have many, many, many transactions. I've got one now. I'm break, what's that? I've got one now. you got one now. Natalie has one right now. So we have many, many, many like that. Okay, there's a bunch of you guys out there. You're going to run into each other, just the way it is. Um, and that's uh so natalie if you weren't do you have is it your listing no no it's kim's i think kim laney, kim laney? Yeah. yeah so kim if kim doesn't have the transaction for you should make sure well you're automatically assumed to be a transaction broker in florida but she needs to make sure she does kim, one of our top agents i'm sure she does but she needs to make sure that she's used the right forms and has transitioned to transaction broker or she just did it right the first time and used the transaction broker listing form. That's what I, I like about that. Now, why would you ever use the single agent? Who here has used a single agent um, exclusive right of sale? Nobody's ever used one? Because it seems more popular than, than that. Um, but if you've ever used one, it does say stuff on there that might make a seller feel better. So it might be a better, it might be a, a more comfortable feeling to a seller when you first go over it with them. You have these responsibilities, not just honesty, fairly, and, and, and uh, with diligence, but you have to, um, you're a, uh, oh gosh, you have all kinds of duties that you don't have as a transaction broker. Okay. So um, it might make the seller feel warm and fuzzy at the time, but if you have to go back and later transition to a transaction broker, that's when you lose the warm and fuzzies because you have to explain to them, look, I'm working for everybody now. I know I was your person. I'm working for everybody now, All right? Um, conditional termination. Um, at the seller's request, broker may agree to terminate, conditionally terminate this agreement. If broker agrees to conditional termination, seller must sign a withdrawal agreement, reimburse broker for all direct expenses incurred in the marketing property and pay a cancellation fee. All right? You guys can, although you usually don't, enforce this. You can get back any marketing stuff that you put into it. Now, this language has been changed. It used to just be there's a cancellation fee and here's what it is. And what I would recommend to you guys then is to say, look, I'm going to spend $200 for photos. I'm going to spend, you know, $150 on open houses and blah, blah, blah. So let's make this thing 350 bucks. So I'm just, you know, reimbursed for my expenses. There's a way to sell that to the, to the client that's a positive. Um, but this says now that they'll re reimburse you for, um, expenses incurred in marketing the property and pay a cancellation fee. I don't like to charge cancellation fees. I think that creates a, uh, a, a, a system of trust if you don't charge one, but some people will charge one to be, to make it punitive. Say, look, if you're going to cancel on me, it's going to cost you $1,500, right? So what do you guys do? Are you guys using cancellation fees? Zero, right? Yeah. Why Natalie? Why zero? You're muted. It's good customer service. I, I, it's just good customer. And I know they won't warm, cancel on warm me. And yeah, and I tell them, I said, right. you're not going to cancel on me. But if you do, <laughs> you have a zero cancellation fee. Cool. Cool. Malvis? So do you write zero You Do you write zero dollars in there? Yeah. Zero. Yeah. Zero point zero. It'll come up as a number. Zero point zero. Okay. I had my last listing that I sold in June. I was the listing agent and I, of course I didn't charge any cancellation fee because the guy was so frustrated with um, the virus and you know we have we lost the deal three times because you know the buyers that were coming in were losing their jobs one of them went to China and couldn't come back because the flights were canceled I mean all kinds of stuff happened 
So he was frustrated at one point, and of course, you know, he came to me and, you know, to vent his frustrations, and he's like, I, I think I'm just going to rent the house to my son, and I think I'm just not going to sell it right now. Um, and I said, uh, I pointed, actually, I pointed that out to him. I said, do you remember when we met? I told you you can cancel any time, and I will not charge you for it. Because uh, he was asking me how much would he have to pay. Um, he wasn't very open at the beginning in the conversation, but I knew what he had in the mind of his head. He just wanted to be out. And and I so th I when we had that conversation, I brought up all that I've done uh, for him, including my trips to his house because he he doesn't do electronic signatures or whatsoever. He didn't let me put a lock in the in the property. He didn't let me put a sign. I mean, I I worked really hard for these sellers, and it's my fault that COVID nineteen came in and we had to cancel three contracts. So when we had that conversation and he was asking about that, I pointed out. I said I didn't charge him anything if he wanted to cancel because he had the free will to do so. However, I brought up all that I've done for him. And I said, let's give it another try. I know this is our third time, but let's give it another try. Let's give it two, three weeks and we'll see what happens. But I didn't, I didn't, I don't charge them but that because that'll give them, uh, I don't know, a little bit of trust that, you know, they can come back uh, and have a peace of mind that they're not going to lose money over pulling the house off the market. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, let's go to dispute resolution. This agreement will be construed under Florida law. All controversy claims and other matters in question amongst the party arising out, arising out of this or relating to this agreement or the breach thereof will be settled by first attempting mediation of the rules of the American Mediation Association or other mediator agreed upon by the parties. If litigation arises out of this agreement, the prevailing party will be entitled to recover reasonable attorney fees and costs unless the parties agree that disputes will be settled by arbitration as follows. I see these, I see a lot of people, everybody signs off on these. Do you guys know that you're agreeing to arbitration when you do this, as opposed to mediation? Okay, you can do that if you'd like. That's fantastic, it's fine. Um, I, I agree with that, but not everybody understands that. And they think they gotta go to court and they gotta hire a lawyer and all that kind of stuff. So just know what you're having them sign and be able to explain it to them, the difference between an arbitrator and mediation. Does anybody know the difference? The, isn't the arbitration kind of like going in the aura with somebody that will kind of smooth things out and come up to an agreement before everybody goes to court? It's similar to the aura process, but it's not aura. No, the aura doesn't have any any um, standing with regular citizens. So um, it's not aura. There's actual arbitration courts. So you go to an actual arbiter. It's it's it's. Mediate, mediation tries to get the parties together to settle on something so they don't have to sue each other. Arbiter just decides, done. So if you agree to arbitration, you're agreeing to what one person says one day and boom, you're done. Or a panel. Whatever. Arbiters like, they're like a judge really. <laughs> yeah, they're like, they're like a judge who just uh, splits the baby typically. All right? So um, that's, that's that. So make sure you know what you're doing when you're having signed because you know, when people got to initial something, they're going to ask questions. What is this? And you tell them in case there's any dispute. Of course, there's not going to be because I'm great and you're great. Um, let's go down to miscellaneous. Agreement is by, so you guys, if, if your seller dies, what happens to your listing? Goes to probate. <laughs> well, not the listing, but just don't just. The listing, right. The listing, the listing goes to the heir. So the listing is still active even after, the listing is for the property even after uh, the seller dies. Okay. And if you die, um, it's still active with us as Florida Realty Investments, and we'll just give it to a better agent. Um, just kidding. We'll give it to. <laughs> if the heirs, if the heirs have to do probate, that can take a while, though. No? Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a process, and it's different for everybody. Uh, so yeah, it's absolutely a process. Um, depends on their their uh, situation with their will and. <laughs> Okay, um, so that's that. Um, do you guys want to discuss the short sale addendum or do you guys want to discuss homeowners addendum or what do you guys want to do? 
Anybody have any questions about the short sale addendum? Or anybody have any questions about the listing agreement in general now that we're done? Yes, Melvis. I have a question about the short sale addendum. I've seen in the okay. MLS what is your question? addendums already pre field that the listing agent or the seller is asking the buyers to do their home inspections before the short sale is approved. Um, is okay. it that service to the buyer? Because they, they shouldn't waste their money on an inspection on a short sale that has not been approved yet. They okay, so here's what, here's what I would do, Malvis. You're absolutely right, you're 100% right. So what I would do is not fill that one out. I would present my own, signed by the my buyer, and let them sign it, okay? Oh, okay. Because um, you do not want to start anything until you get third-party approval. That is a waste of money. How many percentage-wise do you guys, any of you guys have any, um, any experience with short sales? How many percentage-wise do you think of the first offer gets accepted? Or even negotiated to acceptance? Any guesses? I, I think they will, they will accept it because these guys can pay anyway. So it's in the best interest of the lender to, to sell it, isn't it? Well, let me, let me tell you the process real quick. Um, the number is very low. And let me tell you the process for those of you who don't know. Um, so someone comes to me with a short sale property. Okay, I can't pay my, can't pay my mortgage. They're going to foreclose on me. I owe more than it's worth, right? Um, first, let me tell you this. You guys are seeing a lot of pre-foreclosures out there, right? Yes. Okay. You're seeing a lot of pre-foreclosures out there. These are people who owe their back. They're run behind on their rent because a lot of, because of the COVID or whatever. Right. And they owe um, months of mortgage, but a lot of people, as opposed to 2008 right now, a lot of people are actually owe less than their house is worth. Right. Cause the house prices haven't dropped yet. Is anybody with me? Yes. Okay. Because the house prices haven't dropped yet, so they're not they're not upside down in their house. A lot of them, so they're going to try to sell off their house. Now, for people who are upside down in their house, it's not going to be as many right now this time because there wasn't a huge bubble that burst. But for those people who are upside down in their house, short sale is a good thing for them. So what they'll do is they'll come to you and and or you'll find them and they need to short sale. So I'm going to list that property for what it's worth. All right. First of all, you got to you get a negotiator involved who's going to negotiate with the bank to get them to even agree to short sale. Then I'm going to put that property for what I believe it's worth. So I say the property is worth two fifty nine. Okay, this property is. I'm going to get offers because it's a short sale. I mark it as a short sale. What is my typical offer going to be? What do you guys think? Below. Right, right, right. It's gonna be it's gonna be two thirty nine. Right, it's gonna be two thirty nine or two twenty five or some nonsense like that. So that's why. But do I care as a listing agent? Not really. Right. I'm gonna have my seller sign that offer. I mean, if I get three of them on the same weekend, I'm gonna take the best one. Okay, because I hope it goes through. So I'm gonna take the best one. If I get a reasonable one, I'm gonna take that one. But whatever I get, even if I just get garbage, I'm gonna have my seller sign it and submit it to the bank. Right. And I've got to submit comps. I got to do all kinds of stuff and they're going to do their own stuff. They are going to, they have 30 days to respond to that. Right. And so they're going to respond with either a typically a counter and a counter might be the 259 I was asking for it. Right. They're going to counter that. And the buyer who offered 225 for this 259 house, what are they going to do when they get their counter for 255 instead of 259 instead of the 225 It's 255. What are they going to do? Take it. Take it. No, no, no. They got countered at 255. They're, now they're paying almost market price. They're not going to accept that, right? <coughs> so typically, they're the law. So typically, these first offers. That's why they don't. That's why they don't uh, do inspections and, or anything like that because they're not going to waste money until they get a bank approved. So you guys have seen listings, short sale listings. It says bank approved price, right? You guys. Uh -huh. have seen those? That means it's already. They've already had one offer. So when you're the listing agent, you just want to get that first offer out of the way, get a bank approved price. So now we've got a bank approved price. I know the bank will take 255. So now I can put bank approved price up there. And, and now I've got a price of 255. So now when you're the list, when you're a buyer's agent and you see that bank approved price 255, 
I now know don't go in at 225 unless the thing's been on the market for you know two years, which is not going to be typically. But I know if I've got someone who's looking for a value, I might offer 250 now for that because I might be able to negotiate in between there, right? And that second offer a lot of times is going to work because it's going to be near the bank's asking price because I know it's a bank approved price. The bank has already countered somebody else at that price. So now the bank, I looked at the thing and I saw it was pending for 30 days at, it doesn't say what it was, the price was, but it was pending for 30 days. Then it went back on the market with a bank approved price at 255, but that was a month ago and they haven't had any offers since then. Now I can make them an offer for 245, right? And probably buy the house for 250. Okay, does everybody understand that? And sometimes the whole, it, it, sometimes it's a lot lower than that, but, but, but that's typically the situation, okay? You can get good deals on, on short sales, um, particularly 10 years ago when banks were hurting and selling them off as quick as they could. All right? Um, but that's another that question. Yes. Um, when you're writing up an offer for a short sale, mm -hmm. for closing date, what do you put in there? Do you leave it in blank or do you put in after third party approval or do you put in? Within, within, within 30 days of third party approval. Okay. All right. Or whatever, you, whatever it is. You write within that 45 down within days, of, days. Within 45 days. Cause I'm not doing, I'm not doing anything on this. I'm not spending a dime on this until I get, I will, I will submit, uh, have your buyer submit uh, all their loan, all their uh, loan applications and all that kind of stuff. Get that ball rolling. But I'm not putting a, a dime into this particular property until I'm uh, approved, until I have third party approval. Again, the seller himself or herself is just going to sign any contract they get because they're not getting any money out of this anyway. They, they legally cannot walk with a penny from this, right? So they're going to sign whatever deal they get. And I'm going to tell them if I'm the listing agent, I'm going to tell my seller, just sign it. We got to get the ball rolling, right? So they're going to do that. But uh, I mean, it may be a full price offer or it may be nothing. I probably, actually, I would list it a little bit lower than market value to start with to just to get some offers because I need offers to get going on it. Okay. Everybody got that? Any questions on that? So yeah, the most important thing on here, you're right now, but the most important thing on here is the time period. Number three on the short sale addendum to purchase and sale contract. Number three, except for approval deadline, all time periods for inspections, contingency deposits, other obligations under the contract shall commence for the date Seller delivers written notice to buyer that the contract has been approved by the lender. All right. So it has third party approval. That's when we have a real contract. Okay. And that is why on the short sale addendum, the other one to the listing. So there's a short sale addendum for the listing agent that the short sale as well for the contract. Does everybody understand that? Two different addendums, one for the seller, one for the buyer. Everybody understand that? Give me a nod. Um, one, awesome. no. Awesome. Two different addendums, two different short sale addendums, you said? There's a, there's a short sale addendum to exclusive right of sale listing agreement. Uh, yeah. See that? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. And then there's a short sale addendum to purchase and sale contract. Uh-huh, yeah, okay. All right, so one is for the listing and one is for the sale, okay. right? And so what I'm telling you, Malice, on that case that you were talking about, the yeah. other thing under number three is all time periods on the contract shall commence from the effective date under the contract. Do not ever agree to that unless you want your client to waste a bunch of money on, on inspections. Oh, we always check the one that says after third party approval. After the approval, right. So actually, technically it says contract has been approved by the lender. Okay, it says all time periods, escrow, everything, after it's been approved by the, um, the lender. So you don't even put in a deposit on it until nope. you actually, that time starts. You don't have a deal. It's just like the lender is taking the place of the seller pretty much. You don't have a deal until the seller signs. You wouldn't make a deposit before seller signs. You wouldn't do an inspection before seller signs. Same for the lender, okay? Any other questions on that? You guys have any questions on homeowners addendums or anything like that? I'm, I'm sure you guys pretty much have that. Um, make sure you understand special assessments, all that. Make sure you understand, do you guys understand what to do when there's overlaying HOAs? Like in Metro West, for example, like in Errol Estates and Apopka, 
there's over there's a, a larger HOA and then there's individual neighborhood HOAs. You guys understand that? You you mean when there's multiple HOAs? Right. So the Legends in Claremont has a big HOA and then the neighborhoods inside have separate HOAs. Um, anywhere that had, um, you guys may or may not care or know this, but anywhere that had multiple builders building in the same subdivision, it's going to have multiple HOAs. Okay. So, and, and you may not even remember that that's the way it was done, but that's the way it was. So um, any questions on that? Multiple HOAs on the HOA addendum, how to do that? Uh, Just so you know, that's why they give you the three at the bottom there to fill out. Right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Everybody knows. And they'll say, and they give you up top um, on the first page, Make sure you make sure you lay them out separately so they know one is going to one. One may be quarterly, one may be monthly. There's gonna be all kinds of confusing stuff there. Guys, why do we have HOA addendums? Does anybody know? I'm sorry, HOA disclosure addendums. Same reason we have any form. At one point, some idiot bought a property and said, I didn't know there was an HOA. They nobody told me, right? I knew there was a gate. And, and tennis courts and a basketball court and, and shrubbery that was well taken care of, manicured, but I didn't know this was an HOA, right? So they sued somebody and then from now on, everybody's got to have an HOA addendum, right? So makes it easier. Um, any questions on that? Anybody, anybody know how to get HOA docs? Anybody know how to get all that stuff? You can anybody? from the seller or you can call the HOA and have them email them to you. Right. The HOA uh, association management, the CAM for the place, it might be a big management company. It might be, might be the, um, just, it might just be the HOA president that's there. They don't have a management company. So whoever it is, you guys can find it, right? Perfect. I am, but um, they are going to charge. Um, most, uh, a lot of people charge for condo docs for running off 147 pages or something like that, but a lot of them don't charge. A lot of them nowadays are just are electronic. And some of them use them, like some of the management companies use them as a, uh, as a profit center, but it's become more and more easier and easier to do and more and more uh, electronic. So a lot of times they'll just email them to you nowadays. But yes, yeah, some of them still charge. What is, the, what is the form that you are talking about the homeowner association? Uh, the Homeowners Association Disclosure Form. This one. Oh, too close. Again, due to contract. All right. Again, due to contract. If you just type in in your search bar on Transaction Desk, if you just type in homeowner, it'll come up. I did it. Don't type in HOA, type in homeowner. All right, any other questions? If you need help with that, Martha Lane, I'll be happy to help you after. I just have one last question, Ryan. Uh, yes. Regarding condo docs, when, yes. you have, when you are listing condominiums, I know you have, you have to have the seller's disclosure, like the seller's condominium disclosure but then you also have to have the condo rider. Um, and also, what are the condo docs that you have to legally give to the buyer? Is that the uh, bylaws, like the bylaws by the association? Yeah, so you're gonna have bylaws and then, and then if you have a lender involved, they're gonna want the budget too. But condos are almost always, I'm gonna say always, because I, I, don't, I don't know of any examples if they're not, um, run by uh, com um, community association managers, which are big, typically bigger companies that have people and they typically send them to you electronically right away. Um, so typically it's not, a, it's not a hard thing to do at all. And, and like Martha Lena was saying, you used to have to pay to get a, to get a copy of them. Um, but nowadays, most of the time they're electronic and they'll send them to you for free. But if I, but the bylaws is what is required to be given? Or is it uh, bylaws, rules and regulations, all kinds of stuff. Just get anything. They'll send you everything. They'll send you everything. They know what you're doing. They, they, they're dealing with that quite a bit. They know what lenders need. They know what, uh, 
realtors are requesting typically. And you okay. have a lot of people buy condos and not even ask for them if they're paying cash. Right. But lenders want to see the budget. They want to make sure the place isn't in trouble, et cetera. They want to know about any pending lawsuits. They'll have questionnaires also, make sure there's no lawsuits, that kind of thing. You also have to make sure that they are uh, approved to have VA loans or FHA because some of the condos are weird with that. Yep. Right. Some, are, some are approved and not approved. Most most lenders will know that and the, and the CAMs will know that. So a CAM is a uh, community association manager. I called HUD before to find out. I lost you there, Malmas. I said I have called HUD before. Okay. Now, if the condominiums were allowed to accept FHAs. Okay. Go ahead. Um, what's well, the easiest way to find the HOA management? Well, now, if I list something um, on uh, MLS, as you guys know, nowadays it's required to put some kind of HOA management contact in there. Have you guys seen that? Not if you have. Yes. It's required to put some kind of HOA management stuff on there. Um, otherwise, I found them before through Google. I've uh, found them before um, by asking the seller. Um, so that's typically what you would do. Um, sellers typically know how to contact them. I have a question in reference to auction so the properties. The easiest way nowadays, most of the time, it's listed. Yes. You were talking about OHA. Now, uh, some of the auction properties, they also accept uh, your clients to have financing. And when I try to look for the HOA information, I call the, um, of course, the realtor. I call also the, the listing realtor. I also call the association and none of them wanted to give me the information because it was an auction property. How can we proceed to that? They said I had to contact the you owner. Didn't have it under contract? I'm sorry? I was planning to put you, a contract. You, you have to have it under contract before they'll give you the information? Uh, it seems, well, yeah. they didn't want to give me the, the property says uh, in the listing, check your homeowners association information before putting a contract. So that's what I did, and, but I was not able, I contact two different management companies for that area, and uh, none of them wanted to give me the information because the house was going for auction. The only way was to get the original owner, which is already, uh, the house was already empty, in order to give them the okay in writing for me to get that information, which of course is already bank owned and they just, so I was not able to find that information. There wasn't more um, properties on the same area on, uh, on the market? Yes, that's how I got the information, but I wanted to know if they have how, it seems like they owe a lot of money for the uh, homeowners association. And I wanted to know before putting the offer, how much it was that amount. Any thoughts, <laughs> any ideas? Uh, no, typically, typically I haven't heard of that. Um, I bought auction properties before and I do a uh, title search and lien search on them. Um, it should be under a lien search, but you have to pay for it. And that is the, that is the, uh, title company. That, will that do that. The, mm -hmm. Yeah. The title company will do that. And it's a, well, they'll, they'll order the lien search for you, but it's, you know, it's an expense and, and playing with auctions is an expensive game. Um, mm -hmm. but it can be very rewarding as you know. Um, and so you just gotta be, you just gotta be, you gotta spend the money to do it. But if you have a good relationship with a title company, they'll do it for you for, for cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. But, but yeah, a lien, a lien search is the only way to do that, um, to find out if the HOA has leaned them. And they'll, they, they should have leaned them by now. If it's, if it's an, an auction, I'm sure that they're behind it. I'm sure they've been leaned. Any other questions about any of this stuff? 
Uh, Ryan, quick question. Can we go back to the listing agreement real quick on uh, the arbitration section? Yes. Um, where the seller and sales associate initials, that's optional, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, so you're either going to go to mediation, like mm -hmm. like anybody, if you sue me for anything, we're going to go to mediation. Right. But if you, uh, but this, this allows you to go straight to arbitration. Okay. Which is, right. cheaper, which is cheaper for everybody up front. Um, in the mediation, and then we can't, let's say we go to mediation, we can't agree on anything because we both think we're right. And we're not going to agree to compromise. Then we go to court and whoever wins, the other one's going to have to pay, I'm going to win. So you're gonna to have to pay my legal fees mm -hmm. plus whatever I sued you for, right? Mm -hmm. So that's okay. That's the difference between the two. Um, it's kind of cutting lawyers out of the process. For the okay. Part. Okay. But as long as we don't have to enforce them to, to initial that section, then it it just automatically reverts to mediation. Correct. It automatically okay. reverts to a regular lawsuit. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about the retained deposits at number eight compensation? Uh, what do you put right. under that? that percentage what's like a standard number um i i i, I would leave it blank it's, okay. it says 50 percent if left blank i yeah. don't i have i have never ever 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 retained anybody's deposit okay um i think that's a bad way to do business yeah i, I agree sellers don't appreciate it mm -hmm. um i want to work with people over and over and over again all right thank you their mindset they're angry right Right. So you're, so you're better off putting zero here. Okay. Thanks. But I've I've always, to be honest, I, I don't believe in leaving blanks, but I actually usually leave that blank, and that I never would enforce the fifty percent because okay. they're angry, they just lost a deal, etc. Okay. Yeah. I've got a stupid question, Ryan. I just want to know on um, where it says about the percentage of the purchase price to a broker who has no brokerage relationship with the buyer. Like, who has no broker relationship with the buyer? Why is that even in there? I just, I always wondered that. Well, it's, um, it's a non-rep. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, I'm not 100% sure. I've been confused about this before, what okay. a non-rep is. I always go right across the board with the same 3% or whatever. Um, if they brought the buyer and they're licensed, pay them. I, I don't know who's a non-rep. It's not a, it's not a, uh, has nothing to do with their realtor membership. I, I'm not even hundred percent sure what a non-rep is. Um, no brokerage. Oh, you know what? I bet it's just if you're, you're licensed like in the state of Florida, but you don't hang your license with a broker. No, you can't do that. No? That's not even, that's not legal. Um, uh, a broker. Well, if they're their own broker and they're not, I don't no, know. No, no, we only pay brokers. We don't pay agents anyway. Yeah, I mean, so a broker who brokers. has no brokerage relationship with the buyer. That's just yeah. always. I, I don't know. I, I honestly, I used to know and I forget, but it has something to do with agency and I don't remember exactly. Um, I'll figure it out. But you still put a 2.5 or 3 percent in there. Yeah, or you, you can do zero or one, whatever. Hold on one second. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So no, nobody knows. So <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, all right. So any other questions? Nope. All good. All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming and uh, we will see you next week. Um, those of you who have awards coming, we have Natalie came by and got her picture yesterday. I'm sure she'll have it on her uh, social media. Those of you who have awards coming um, tomorrow, downtown from 9 to 12, um, you come down and get a picture with our lovely background here. And our lovely broker, Carissa, will be down there taking pictures with you guys. Um, I'll be there as well. And then, um, and then Thursday in Tampa from 10 to 1. I'm sorry, next Tuesday in Tampa from 10 to 1. Um, same deal. And um, if you have any other times that you want to come by and get your picture and maybe you, or get your award, 
uh, maybe you don't want pictures or you don't need the background or whatever, just let me know and we have the awards. Um, or if you want my, your, your award taken somewhere, one of our offices where you can pick it up, just let me know. All right. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys next week and have a great day. Thank, Thank you, you, Ryan. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ryan. You Thank bet. you. Thanks. Bye-bye.